Hello there, everyone. Welcome back to Non Sequitur. Uh, if you're joining us on the heels of the debate last night, uh, Steve, how do you think that went? Oh, I was thrilled by it. I mean, <laughs> it got a little bit over my head because I'm not really into the Bible as much as they are as far as their expertise, but I thought they had a really great dialogue. They had good conversation. Um, there was no really over-talking uh, of any consequence, and uh, they, they probably could have gone on for another two hours, though. Oh, I agree. Um, and excuse me, everyone, I'm uh, getting some kind of cold, so if, I, uh, if I'm sniffling over here, I do apologize. And uh, Let's say hello to our guest tonight. I have been looking forward to this uh, this topic that we're going to talk about um, tonight, and the, the guy's resume is just incredible to say the least. I, I am looking at right now his, uh, his w Wikipedia page, and... I have to say, it is an honor to have someone like yourself um, on here. And there's there's too much for me to go through and read all at one time. So I'll just give you kind of some uh, some highlights here. But uh, he was he's an American scientist and the uh, geophysicist who has studied micro earthquakes associated with active fault systems and volcanic eruptions throughout the Western United States, um, including Alaska, Iceland, Central America, uh, the East African Rift System. He developed a, a, a prototype global uh, volcano surveillance system. I mean, that alone is uh, is badass right there. Uh, he uh, let me sort that. And uh, he was um, educated at uh, at Noble and uh, Greenout School in uh, and Dartmouth College and Columbia University. And um, I'm sure we're gonna we're gonna touch on all of these places but where he is going to be focused with us tonight is going to be on global warming and in 2009 uh, Dr. Ward published a detailed paper suggesting that large volumes of um, forgive me SO2 Steve sulfur dioxide there we go all right um, I'm going to do my best to keep up today guys um, Steve Steve's going to be in his element but I'm going to try to uh, make sure that I at least learned something. Um, it erupted frequently enough to uh, overdrive the oxidizing capacity of the atmosphere, resulting in very rapid warming. So basically, in a nutshell, and I think Steve earlier uh, pointed this out to me. And I, actually, Steve, do you want to kind of explain wh where he's kind of shifting from what the mainstream view of uh, global warming would be? Yeah, I'll give a Maybe a I should second. provide it. Like, Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, why don't you do it? Because sure. that way you, I don't butcher your well, position. One of the most important things in science is to have a little humility and realize that once in a while you don't quite have it right and you can improve. Just as I published that paper in 2009, I suddenly realized that major volcanic eruptions were associated with ozone depletion, depleting the ozone layer. And so my theory of sulfur dioxide uh, which was not fitting the data very well, turned out to be mistaken. And it was at that point in 2009 that I began to understand much better how the ozone layer works and how what the relationship with that is to climate. Awesome. Um, so today we're going to have a, uh, a discussion. We've had several people reach out to us uh, many times over and uh, requesting that we talk about climate change. We've talked about pretty much everything on this show except for that. And a, a big reason for that is Steve and I have actually reached out um, before to uh, a couple of different people. And I don't know what it is about this this issue, but it's it's so divisive in a way that you wouldn't think would be the case. You know what I'm saying, Steve? Like there, there are people who... It is. They they fall really hard on one side or the other. Maybe Dr. Ward, you'll be able to speak to why you know this is such a contentious issue from the get go. But uh, when I got uh, Aaron's email, I was thrilled about uh, having you on. So I'm going to let now you take uh, over and and kind of introduce yourself to everybody and tell uh, people who you are and why you do what you do. I worked 27 years with the United States Geological Survey. Uh, and uh, during that time, won two national awards for educating the public about science. I've always been very much interested in seeing that the best science available be used to, to educate the best public policy decisions available. 
Now, when you talk about global warming, there are several camps. But on the one side, you have the scientists who are absolutely convinced that the science as they understand it shows that greenhouse gases are causing the warming. And if we don't do something about that soon, reducing the emissions of greenhouse gases, the world is in for a real world of hurt. And they genuinely believe that based on the science that they know. On the other side, you have the most effective skeptics have been those who are libertarians. They just don't want the government in their knickers. They don't want the government giving any regulations. And they really don't care about the science, but their, their, their primary goal is to keep the government out of it. And then you have uh, some other scientists who wonder about the greenhouse gas theory. And you have politicians and economic types and so on that are, you know, all to have a different position. And one of the reasons it's gotten so heated is because particularly between the scientists and the libertarians, there's no basis for discussion. The, li the libertarians don't understand the science. The science don't, scientists don't want to be driven by political direction. And this has gone on long enough that it's gotten really bitter. Mm. And that much of what happens is it gets personal. Uh, and we don't need that. I mean, what's turning out to be the case now is the science that a huge majority of scientists think is correct is turning out not to be quite correct. The problem is our understanding of heat and how we calculate heat. And it turns out we've made a mistake going back several hundred years. We've been thinking about heat in the wrong way. When you realize what heat is and how heat flows, and heat is what a body must absorb to get hotter. To increase the temperature of a body, you need to absorb heat. And once we understand what heat is, we begin to understand, first of all, the greenhouse warming theory is mistaken. And secondly, that depleting the ozone layer subjects the world to the greatest amount of heat. And we can go into those details at some length. Where I got interested in this is I retired 20 years ago now. And in uh, 2006, I noticed some things about climate change that just didn't make sense. And I said, the more I looked at it, the data were very good. And I said, you know, if this turns out to be a problem, this could really be important. And so at that point in my life, being retired, I put aside everything else in my life except for my family. And I have worked full time for ever since 2006, trying to comprehend greenhouse gas theory, trying to complement, comprehend climate change, trying to figure out why the earth is getting warmer. And so you, um, you fully believe that, that the, the climate change that we're experiencing now, I guess to start out with, let's, let's sort of see where we are with what's being presented in every day, you know, everybody's life every day. Um, is it the case, like it seems to be, that we are at a point with the, the climate that um, we're almost over that edge where there's no going back? Like how bad is the situation now with the climate? Well, the, what we first need to agree on is the climate is warming. Mm. We've observed about a degree centigrade, almost two degrees Fahrenheit warming starting in about 1970. And it goes back further, but the, the world is warming. It's hard to deny that. The four major data sources that measure temperatures around the earth all agree that there was major warming from 1970 to 1998. There was not much warming from 1998 to 2014. And then there was very rapid warming from 2014 to 2016. And we'll get into the reasons for that uh, soon. Mm -hmm. So the big problem with greenhouse gas theory is that it predicts that several decades ahead now, because of the way they think the increase in greenhouse gases is going to proceed, given that every time we burn fossil fuel, we're emitting greenhouse gases, the models predict there's going to be serious problems in 20, 30 years. It turns out those models are simply wrong. And I'm arguing that there is no reason now to expect the earth to warm any more than it is at the moment, except for certain special kinds of volcanic eruptions that we'll discuss in a minute, mm -hmm. uh, that can cause short-term warming 
that disappears within a decade or so. The problem we're in right now is we depleted the ozone layer significantly from 1970 to 1998. That allows more ultraviolet B radiation from the sun to reach Earth. That is warming the Earth, and it's continuing to warm the Earth because ozone remains depleted. It's likely to be many decades before the ozone layer will return to normal, provided we do the right things. So, so we warmed, we're going to continue to warm, um, but we don't expect to get the kind of warming that's being predicted by all the scientists. So what is it that's, that's causing this? Let's go ahead and, and dive into um, what depleted the ozone in the first place back in the, um, that led to that in the 70s. Well, it turns out we learned in the early 70s, uh, two scientists, well, actually three scientists got the Nobel Prize for figuring out that when you have an atom of chlorine in the lower stratosphere, in the low ozone layer, that one atom of chlorine can end up by destroying 100,000 molecules of ozone. And so there's tremendous leverage. This chlorine is the Achilles heel of the climate. We produced in the 1960s CFC gases, chlorofluorocarbon gases, that were very popular as refrigerants, as spray can propellants, as uh, uh, foam blowing agents, a variety of uses. And they were much cheaper and safer to use than what was available at the time. So they became very popular. Uh, those that are old enough remember in 1970, you could buy almost anything in the spray can. And there was the CFCs that were propelling the things out of the spray can. And the reason they were popular was the CFCs didn't react chemically with what was in the spray can, whereas most other things that we know of would react chemically. So it turned out by 1970 that these chlorofluorocarbons were beginning to increase in the atmosphere. At about the same time, the temperature began to increase. And then we realized in 1985, when we discovered the Antarctic ozone hole, that these um, chlorofluorocarbons had, had gotten enough chlorine up into the atmosphere to cause significant ozone depletion, a much bigger problem than we thought it had been before. It turns out the chlorofluorocarbons, which are very inert, they're not chemically active. When you put them high up in the stratosphere, ultraviolet light from the sun breaks them down and ends up releasing atoms of chlorine. And these atoms of chlorine are very effective at destroying ozone. When you, the ozone layer protects life on Earth from hazardous radiation from the sun. Something we call ultraviolet B radiation is absorbed in the ozone layer, about 95% of it. The 5% that gets through causes sunburn, skin cancer, cataracts. It also turns out to be very important to help our body produce vitamin D. That's very important for our health. So it has some good effects, but it has a lot of bad effects. And we want to minimize the ozone, the ultraviolet B reaching Earth. Ultraviolet B is a much hotter radiation than any other radiation coming to Earth. And so when more of it reaches Earth, when the ozone layer is depleted, Earth gets hotter. And the ozone layer gets cooler because it's not absorbing as much of this radiation. So what I'm pointing out now is that climate change, as we've observed it, is caused by ozone depletion. From 1970 to 1998, that was caused by humans. In 2014, there was a big basaltic eruption in Iceland from a volcano called Barthabunga. And in six months, the lava coming out covered an area of 33 square miles, the size of Manhattan, mm. just in six months. This was the largest lava flow of this type observed since 1783. So several hundred years since we've seen anything like this. It turns out in history, in Earth history, there are times when lava flows like this would have covered almost the whole United States. We're talking about just huge emissions of lava. It turns out that these lava release a great deal of chlorine and bromine into the atmosphere. And this is observed to deplete the ozone layer. 
So throughout all of Earth history, it's this kind of lava that's been causing the major warming. Throughout recent human history, these kind of lavas have caused the warming, but also man happened to do the same thing in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. So uh, what, what, what's your, uh, your take on why you think that this isn't something that is you know, more widely adopted from mainstream science? Like, like why haven't they picked up on this and um, continued looking in what you, you, know, you said earlier was just the wrong direction? Well, you know, what's going on right now is a revolution in science. If I'm correct, it turns out there are several fundamental problems in physics that are the basis of this, what's going on. And so this would be, in the whole historical perspective, a major revolution in science. If you read up on any of the revolutions in science, talking about Earth being flat, talking about um, the Earth revolving around the sun or the sun revolving around the Earth, and all the other smaller ones in between. Scientists at the time are convinced that what they're thinking is right, and they're not open-minded to a fundamental revolution. And that's what's going on now. I'm a scientist. I have a lot of scientific friends. I know a lot of climate scientists. I know a lot of climate skeptics. But on both sides, they're absolutely convinced that what they think is correct is correct. What they don't realize is that the foundational physics upon which they're basing their theory is turning out to be mistaken. And we're talking about a mistake that goes back several hundred years. So it's, it's, non, it's non-trivial. Uh, and it's, it's, we're talking about scientists who spent their whole life believing in greenhouse gas theory, observing things related to greenhouse gas theory, interpreting them in terms of greenhouse gas theory, asking for money to study greenhouse gas theory, writing papers about greenhouse gas theory. So it's perfectly human that they are not really anxious to hear what I'm saying. And in many ways, they'd rather shoot the messenger than listen to the message. Do you, do you so think- at this point, I'm simply being ignored. And I have submitted many papers to top journals. They don't even send them out for review. I've gotten some papers published but I am not getting people to seriously think about the possibility. I'm currently in email discussion with some of the leading climate scientists in the world, trying to convince them that greenhouse gas theory is physically impossible, and it would be very good if the scientists would face up to this problem and help advise governments and other groups what we should do about it. At the moment, their heads are in the sand. They're convinced that their consensus is right. Unfortunately, science is not about consensus. Politics is about consensus. Science is about debate. Do you think that the, the, the greenhouse gas theory is completely wrong, or are there some aspects that play into what's going on as well? Like, is that a just not a biggest factor as they make it out to be, or is it just completely wrong? I've come to the conclusion after a great deal of work the greenhouse warming theory is physically impossible. And if you go to physically-impossible.com, I explain in 650 words why it is physically impossible. There are two basic reasons. First of all, greenhouse warming theory assumes that radiation from Earth is absorbed by greenhouse gases, and one way or another, causes Earth to get warmer. Well, it's physically impossible for a body to be warmed by its own radiation. If you think of two bodies at the same temperature and they're both radiating towards each other, nothing's gonna get warmer. There's no way to get warmer. They're the same temperature. No heat is flowing. The radiation from a given body cannot warm that body. The only way to warm a body of matter is to absorb radiation from a hotter body, like the sun, and that's the way Earth gets warmed. So number one, greenhouse gases, um, in no way can the radiation from Earth cause the warming of Earth. The second point is that some people say greenhouse gases cause Earth to warm because they form a blanket around Earth, and this keeps Earth from cooling 
makes Earth cool more slowly, which they think means the Earth must get hotter because it's not losing heat as rapidly as it's gaining heat. Well, if you have a body of matter on the table and you throw a blanket over it, you will slow the cooling of that body of matter, but you will not cause that body, the temperature of that body of matter to increase. Again, it's physically impossible. So there are two fundamental reasons that greenhouse gas theory is physically impossible. And I'm trying to get that across now. This is early uh, in the effort. Um, over the next months and next year or so, I hope that everybody listening to this program will start hearing that from um, national news media and other spaces, because it is absolutely clear that it's not the greenhouse gas theory has some problems. It is physically impossible. All right, um, if I can ask, let's, let's kind of go back to the very beginning of this, because I think it's really important to, to talk about, according to what you're saying. Your, your first thing was dealing with heat, right? And you said having a, a good understanding of what heat is is fundamental to this. Would you agree? Yes. Okay. Basically, um, and heat is the transfer. Of thermal, would you define heat as the, the, the transfer of thermal energy from a region of a higher concentration to a lower concentration? It's the flow of thermal energy, right? Yes has to be in motion. I like to say that I like to say that heat is what a body has to absorb to get hotter. Okay, so whether it comes from radiation or whatever, for a body to get hotter, it must absorb heat and uh, to get to a higher temperature. Now in 1900, Max Planck, one of the fathers of modern physics, showed that temperature is the result of oscillations in matter at a whole broad range of frequencies, a whole spectrum of frequencies. We know that light comes in a spectrum, goes all the way from red to blue, and many different frequencies. Well, electromagnetic radiation, the things radiated by a body of matter as a result of its temperature, covers a much, much broader range of frequencies, all the way from radio signals in the, in the thousands of cycles per second all the way up to gamma rays at 10 to the 20 cycles per second. And heat then is made up of all these frequencies. And what Planck did was wrote an equation back in 1900 based on observations in the laboratory showing that a body of matter radiated this band of frequencies as a result of its temperature. The higher the temperature, the broader the band, the higher the frequency. So heat is the result of a spectrum of frequencies. At the moment, all physicists, all climate scientists, think of heat like gasoline. The more you pour in, the hotter you get. And that's not right. Heat is a function of frequency spectrum, which is determined by the source of the heat. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to parse that out a little bit because I, I agree with you. Things will have a higher temperature as they absorb heat, but in that case, the heat is the thermal energy. So heat, as I learned it in thermodynamics, was that it literally is a transfer of thermal energy from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration. And if that's the case, if you have solar radiation striking the Earth with a higher greenhouse effect, if you have a lot of greenhouse gases, that is going to trap that thermal energy, would it not? It doesn't trap the heat because heat has to be in motion. You can't store heat, right? You, you, can't, you, can't, you can't say, like, this, this brick has a lot of heat. Um, it's not stored, and it has to be moving from one place to another. So you have, you have heat coming into the system, and then it's trapped in the form of thermal energy in the atmosphere. That, it doesn't work that way, you're saying? Well, what you're saying is absolutely right on target for current thinking. What is the mistake is, is that the amount of heat is not important. It's the temperature of the heat, essentially. It's the temperature of the radiation that, it's the temperature of the body that's giving, that's emitting the radiation. And you could think, therefore, that the radiation has that same temperature. That's the maximum temperature to which a body absorbing that radiation can be raised. And so radiation mm -hmm. from Earth absorbed by a body can only raise that body to the temperature of Earth, no higher. 
Whereas at the moment, the common thinking, pretty much as you said, is the more quantity, the more amount of heat you have, the hotter it will get. But that's the mistake. It isn't the amount. Yeah, they, no, it's the frequency intensity. content. It's the intensity. Okay, because I, like, I remember it as intensity. Okay. I'm still trying to wrap it my head around very that, the temperature of the heat. Well, it, it turns out this has forced it's me to, to think what's going on at the atomic level. And what I've put together now is a very clear explanation of what's happening at the atomic level. It all makes sense and explains these frequencies. And I can go into that. But well, the way anyway, I learned I think, I'm just trying to explain it for the audience because the audience seems to be really all over the place right now. Um, so I'm just trying to clarify it for them. Um, the way I learned a temperature, temperature literally is the intensity of the amount of heat in a system. And so, from, again, in, in flow, in transit. So you're, you're saying that because a body can only have as much heat in that system as it's radiating for itself, it can't absorb anything from an open, like in an open system from the sun and cause that to go hotter? No, the only way to heat a body is to absorb energy from a body like the sun that is hotter. Okay. Let's okay. let's go. Let's look at the, let's 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 raise the issue of what is thermal energy. What we know is that all the bonds holding matter together, all the chemical bonds that hold the atoms together, that make up matter, are oscillating. They're not fixed. They're not rigid, and they're oscillating. The higher the temperature of the bonds of the matter, the higher the frequencies and the higher the amplitudes of the oscillation. If you increase the temperature enough, the matter falls apart. The bonds fall apart. The amplitude of oscillation got too big for the bonds. And the bonds are held mm -hmm. together by electromagnetic forces, the attraction of, of uh, different charges, plus and minus, and the um, repulsion of the same charges. So anyway, we know that all these bonds are oscillating. And it's the higher the temperature of the body, the higher the amplitude and the frequency. So that is what thermal energy is in matter. Now these oscillations on the surface of matter emit radiation in the same way that a radio transmitter and antenna emits a radio station. That's at one frequency. You send an oscillation into the antenna at the frequency of, that's been licensed for your radio station. Over at the receiver, you tune the receiver to resonate to that frequency. You, and, and resonate is where the frequency on the receiver is exactly the same as the frequency of the particular bond that's transmitting that frequency across space. And when you resonate, you increase the amplitude of oscillation of the lower temperature bond. So what happens is the bond on the surface of the sun is resonating with a bond on our surface, and they're ending up sharing their amplitude of oscillation, essentially averaging it. So the one on Earth gets higher amplitude, and the one on the sun gets lower amplitude. So this is how a radio station transmits at one frequency. Heat is a spectrum of all frequency, and this resonance is going on simultaneously. Now, one way to understand okay. resonance so. is when you push a kid on a swing, okay? If you, the, the, the swing is going back and forth at a given frequency. If you push at exactly the same frequency, the swing will swing higher and higher and higher. That's resonance. Whereas if you push at a different frequency, the swing will begin to just get all confused and will stop moving even. That's non-resonance. So resonance is, is, is simply that a way of... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Is that what? We have a little bit of lag here. Oh. We have a little bit of lag here. Please continue. Well, let me, let me say that's resonance is how we hear. Sound waves, sound pressure changes in the air go into our ears and those frequencies resonate with little cilia, little hairs in the inner ear. And which hairs resonate 
transmit signals to the brain, which it knows is that frequency. This is the way we see everything you look at, the molecule on the surface, let's call it red, um, is oscillating at the red and it gets focused on a cell in your eye, in the cones of your eye, that responds, that resonates with that frequency. And there are actually three cones for three different colors, and the amount they resonate gets transmitted to the brain, and the brain can distinguish a million different colors just from those three signals coming from the resonance of the cones in your eyes. So the way we interact with nature, the way we physically interact with the world around us is primarily through resonance, sound, sight, and now there's evidence that smell and taste also are resonant phenomenon. And if a small number of sensors mixed together can allow you to, to uh, be aware of a million different tastes, of a million different smells. Anyway, resonance turns out to be all around us. It's the way the world works. It's the way we interact with the world. And it turns out to be the way he is transferred from one body to another. Yeah, I, I, t I totally agree about your, the resonating of bonds, right? I, I do agree that there's, the potential energy for a bond can act as a harmonic oscillator and that there's a certain amount of energy that can be imparted to it to act as a disassociation energy, right? Is that, and, and I totally agree with you on that. I'm only trying to trying to figure out how do you relate that to what's happening in the ozone layer. You're saying because the ultraviolet radiation is such a high energy, it's causing disassociation, um, and that's causing the ozone depletion, and that's causing the, the having the major effect on ozone. Excuse me, a major effect on global warming because of disassociation. Well, we need into chlorine. We need to pull that. We need to pull that apart a little bit. The resonance I'm talking about is matter, and how matter receives absorbs energy and emits energy. What's happening in the ozone layer is, and in the upper atmosphere is that ultraviolet B and ultraviolet C in the upper atmosphere is causing the dissociation of uh, molecules of oxygen, ozone, and other molecules. Dissociation means the bond breaks apart. When the bond breaks apart, the pieces of the molecule fly apart at very high velocity. Now, in a gas, the temperature of a gas is equal to, uh, proportional to the velocity squared of all the molecules that make up the gas. So temperature in a gas is created by dissociating molecules into atoms that then fly away at very high velocity. And this is what makes the sure. stratosphere so much warmer. You know, Earth cools, as you go up in the atmosphere, through the troposphere, Earth is cooling, and it's much colder at the tropos pause of the top of the troposphere. Then as we go up through the stratosphere, it's warming. And it's being warmed because of ultraviolet C and ultraviolet B dissociating molecules in the stratosphere and dissociating electrons up in the ionosphere. So in that case, what the problem is that when that, some of that ultraviolet B reaches Earth, it not only gets absorbed by the oceans, which it penetrates hundreds of meters, so it causes the oceans to warm. It also interacts with um, ozone that is a result of pollution. In the areas around the world where there's a lot of industry and a lot of people, we have ozone pollution that's created as an effect of nitrogen and, and various ox um, there's all kinds of chemical reactions that lead to what's called the bad ozone. Ozone at Earth that oxidizes things very quickly. When ultraviolet B comes down from the sun, it interacts and blows that apart, warming the air. And that's part of what makes the air warmer. And that's part of the reason why, since 1970, the warming was twice as great in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere the warming was much greater in the more populated areas, in the more industrial areas. So again, directly warming air is quite different from directly warming matter. With matter, you need all these frequencies and you need what we talk of as heat. Uh, warming gases, however, we just have to speed up the velocity of the molecule.
Okay, I, I, I actually think I understand what you're saying. I don't think the audience is maybe. So let me see if I can parse this out to them because I'm trying to relate this to as I, as I would to a fission reaction. What happens in uranium-235, it absorbs a neutron, produces fission fragments, and those fission fragments are resonating. And that, reson that, that resonation is actually kinetic energy. And that kinetic energy is in the form of heat. So you have a higher temperature of the system because you have oscillations going on. So you're saying that you have ultraviolet radiation comes in, it, it'll strike a CFC, that CFC will disassociate, it'll form chlorine, and that, that disassociation energy is being converted into kinetic energy, thus increasing the temperature of the system overall. No. Um, nope. I thought I had the, it. No. No. We're, I was so close. I really, some things I really thought I had it. So it's, yeah. Okay. Try to, yeah, try to light, lighten me here. I really thought I had that. <laughs> what the ozone layer <laughs> normally absorbs the ozone layer normally absorbs about 95% or 90-95% of the ultraviolet B coming in from the sun. And we like this because ultraviolet B is a dangerous radiation. And it's, it's absorbing it because it's converting ozone to oxygen to ozone to oxygen in a cycle that goes on. It turns out an interesting thing about ozone is that an individual molecule of ozone only lives for about eight days. It's continually being recycled in what's called something, it's called the, the oxygen ozone cycle or the Chapman cycle, where oxygen is being broken down by ultraviolet C into atomic oxygens. Those are recombining to form uh, molecular ozone, which is broken down by ultraviolet B, which then uh, comes back together to form oxygen and so on in this cycle. So the ozone layer is absorbing the ultraviolet B coming from the sun. When there is less ozone, it's absorbing less ultraviolet B. That means mm -hmm. more ultraviolet B reaches Earth. And ultraviolet B is a hot radiation, which ends up warming Earth. So it's... So I, it's I really... I thought, I thought you said, though... I thought you said... Just for correct clarification, because I, I thought you said that the actual reaction is causing these molecules to disassociate and, and these atoms to fly apart, and that, that's causing an increase in temperature. That's not the case? That's causing the increase in temperature of the atmosphere. Of the atmosphere. Okay. I'm talking about the, the atmosphere. Right? I'm literally talking about the kinetic, yeah. the kinetic energy in the stratosphere. Okay, so, okay. Okay, so I was kind of correct on that because I was talking literally about just about the stratosphere that it's going to increase in, in temperature because the overall kinetic energy of the system is going to be increasing because of the energy imparting, imparted by the disassociation from the UV rays. But you're now, so now we're switching from the, the troposphere or excuse me, the troposphere and the, and the stratosphere to the Earth itself. And that's, I think, where the disconnect is. What, what's actually causing the overall net increase to the climate of the one degree or one it's a little, I think it's a little more than one degree Celsius overall over the last 100 200 years what is the actual primary cause of that since we have banned uh, CFCs back in the what in the in the 90s uh, the early 2000s it's been a while when we banned them correct I don't know the exact date 2009 was it yeah. oh, what? well they were banned in, in 1987. They, they went, the Montreal Protocol went into effect in 1989. It was, uh, it was 1993 before the increase in CFC stopped. It was 1995 before the increase in ozone depletion stopped. And it was 1998 when the increase in temperature stopped. And then the Earth was pretty constant, the temperature was pretty constant until 2014 when this volcano erupted in Iceland. So the, the warming, the simplest way to think about it is the temperature on Earth is primarily an effect of the thickness of the ozone layer. The thinner the ozone layer, the more ozone is depleted, the warmer Earth is. The thicker the ozone layer, the cooler Earth is. And in fact, the ozone layer changes seasonally. The ozone layer is thickest in the winter over the North Pole in, the, in our winter, over the South Pole in our summer. And it is these 
thicknesses that are actually the depleted ones. But anyway, the simplest way to think about it is the thicker the ozone layer, the colder Earth is. And the reason, and the thinner the ozone layer, the warmer Earth is, the reason is all about ultraviolet B radiation. And ultraviolet B radiation is hot radiation. It burns your skin. So do you think that because of the CFC ban, there would have been a cooling trend after that? Or did we observe a cooling trend? And you think that would have been continu continu continual and contiguous uh, cooling after we had banned CFCs? It wasn't for the volcano eruption? Well, the nasty thing about CFCs, and the reason they were so economically popular, is that they're very slow to be broken down. So we pumped a whole lot of CFCs into the atmosphere and then we stopped pumping them into the atmosphere and we've only gone down about 10 percent okay so that the ozone layer has only come back a small amount compared to what it was in 1970. so we are continuing to heat the oceans and we are continuing to heat the earth and that's anticipated to last for several decades now there are two problems with that it was just discovered this spring that there was uh, huge sources of CFCs suddenly showing up in the atmosphere. And they tracked this down to China. And it turns out that in China, the insulation makers, the people that blow foam to make insulation, were still using CFCs. And nobody was telling them they couldn't do it. Since then, the Chinese government has gotten on their case in the last few months. But still, they slowed the recovery of the ozone layer. The other problem is that in developing countries, they cannot afford to replace the refrigerators and air conditioners that use the Freon and other refrigerants that were CFPs. So there's a big black market, a big enough black market that the UN has written a big thick report about it. A big black market in CFPs. So again, we're not recovering at the rate we thought we would recover. And the rate we thought we would recover was still going to be many decades. Because, so you would agree that the, the primary type, the primary t main causes of CFC pollution, I'm going to call it pollution, is going to be aerosols, refrigerants, and foam then. And then there's some yes. other things, I mean, like solvents and a few other things. But okay, so the, the main ones, so we've eliminated it as a refrigerant, the HFC whatever the number is, I don't remember. Um, but we've eliminated from uh, air conditioning, we've eliminated from, we're trying to from car uh, AC as well, correct? We were very successful at eliminating CFCs. They're outlawed, they've been banned since uh, 1987. We've been very successful at eliminating those. And when you think about it, the fact that we can make a big change by 1993, when it only took effect in 1989, First of all, that's a clear demonstration that the Montreal Protocol was correct, that the warming was caused by the CFCs, and we stopped the increase in warming. But we have not recovered. And the reason we have not recovered is this black market and the illegal use of CFCs. Can I, can I ask, this is, a lot of this work, um, do you know Dr. Liu? Have you read his papers? No. He has a paper on greenhouse effects and halogenated molecules um, as for, for the the reason for climate change, which is, sounds a lot like what you're kind of advocating. I haven't read his paper. I'm familiar with it. Um, I've seen it before, and I just pulled it up. But uh, he's advocating something very similar to what you're advocating, that uh, um, the, the climate change is actually being driven by CFCs um, and uh, disassociation electron transfer uh, rather than which, which, which the typical thing, which would be greenhouse gases. Now, somebody had asked in the live chat, and you had mentioned it earlier, but for their clarification, a greenhouse gas is anything with two or more molecules in the atmosphere. Is that correct? Three, three or more molecules. Three or more. I'm sorry. Three or more atoms. Three, three, three or more atoms. Three or more atoms. So, is Dr. Carbon Liu from Canada? Piece? Um, I have no. No, carbon idea. monoxide is only two. And nitrogen is it's only two, two, so that would not be. A, and, right. Yeah, so carbon monoxide would not I've be. Read over, gas. I've read over 10,000 papers related to climate change, and so I may not remember at any given time exactly which ones. Um, 
the okay. the interesting thing about greenhouse gases is they only absorb some frequencies spectral lines as we typically talk about it in physics so green co2 for example only absorbs the spectral lines the only the frequencies that are the resonant frequencies of the molecule so that energy is being absorbed into the bonds that are holding the molecule together um, and that's not heat that's just less than 16 percent of the frequencies that make up heat so one of the mistakes in greenhouse gas theory is assuming that greenhouse gases absorb heat, which they radiate back to, which either warms the air or radiates back to earth and warms earth. But greenhouse gases are not absorbing heat. CO2 only absorbs 16% of the frequencies required to have heat. Now, if you have 16% of a person, you don't have a person. Okay? so. 16% of the frequencies does not constitute heat. Okay. I, I, I'm kind of following that. Um, let's, let's kind of switch it real quick if I can, because you had mentioned something about the volcanic activity. I'm kind of curious about that. Um, how sulfur dioxide and I guess sulfur hexafluoride would be contributing to the greenhouse effect? Or not, excuse me, not the greenhouse effect, uh, global warming in general. So how does that play into well, it? What I what I discovered in 2009, just after I submitted that paper for publication, was the ozone distribution at uh, Arosa, Switzerland, which was the first station to be built in 1927 to record total column ozone going up through the atmosphere. And what I observed there was that the average ozone was pretty constant for a lot of years until we started manufacturing CFCs, and then we got depleted. But whenever there was a major volcanic eruption, there was a major depletion of the ozone layer for a few years. And the greatest depletion we've ever observed of the ozone layer was in 1992 and 1993, following the 1991 eruption of Pinatubo, the biggest volcanic eruption since 1912. So we observe directly that volcanic eruptions cause very severe ozone depletion, more so than the CFCs did, the much greatest ozone depletion is observed following Pinatubo. The next greatest ozone depletion was observed following AF Bialyokel in Iceland in 2010. That was the eruption everybody heard about because it interrupted with European airspace, closed down the airspace and airplanes were interrupted for, for several weeks. So we observe the volcanic eruptions deplete the ozone layer. Now it turns out following Pinatubo, there was warming that next winter during December, January, February in the Northern Hemisphere when ozone is depleted the most. There was warming of up to three and a half degrees centigrade, huge warming. But the other thing that happens with a big explosive volcano like Pinatubo is it puts a lot of sulfur dioxide and water vapor up in the stratosphere and that forms a sulfuric acid aerosol, a mist. And the particles of that mist grow big enough to reflect and scatter sunlight. So the effect of explosive volcanoes is to form an aerosol that lasts for about three years that is observed to cool Earth about a half a degree centigrade, almost a degree Fahrenheit, for two to four years. We then model that when you cool the whole Earth's surface for uh, just three three years or so, the result on the ocean cools the ocean. That result of that can still be seen a hundred years later. Hmm. So when you have several explosive volcanoes a century, you can over many centuries cool the earth incrementally. What we observe when we go to the ice sheet in, in Greenland and we drill down through the ice and we measure the oxygen isotopes in the air bubbles, and they're related to the temperature at the time the air bubbles formed. We observe that there is periods of very sudden warming within years, followed by centuries and even millennia of slow cooling. And we observe this happening 25 times in the last 120,000 years. So air temperature gets very warm very quickly and cools very slowly. This turns out to be very directly explained by when these basaltic lava flows put out 
uh, chlorine and bromine that causes depletion of the ozone layer, you get rapid warming. But when you have big explosive volcanoes, you have rapid, you have slow cooling, and you have slow cooling over centuries to millennia. So what we realize now is that the kind of volcanism, explosive volcanism causes cooling, effusive basaltic volcanism causes warming. All through geologic time, when we see major warming, we see huge fields of basaltic volcanoes. Whereas when we see cooling, we have major subduction going on of the, of the plates around Earth, and that subduction zones are where the the explosive volcanoes occur, like at Pinatubo, like all around the Pacific Ocean. I kind of jumped into that in a, hurriedly. I should just back up and make sure I got it clear that around the Pacific Ocean, there's a lot of deal with it, right? Fire. Yes, uh -huh. around the Pacific Ocean is what we call a Pacific rim 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 of fire, and there are 452 volcanoes, mostly explosive, in that ring of fire. And they cause cooling. It is the existence of those volcanoes over the last few million years that caused the ice age that we've just come through. Whereas when you have effusive basaltic volcanoes, like we had in Iceland at 10, 12,000 years ago, that's when you get the warming. And continued volcanism of that type for 2,500 years is what warmed the world out of the last ice age. When we go back in time, we find, for example, in historic time, the medieval warm period occurred around 900 AD, 1000 AD, and that was a time of major basaltic volcanism in Iceland. The Roman warm period occurred about 200 BC. That was a time of about 800 square kilometers of lava forming at the Craters of the Moon National Monument in central Idaho. Every time we see major warming, historically, throughout all of Earth history, we find that there is a major basalt flow that occurred at that time that depleted the ozone layer to cause that warming. Sometimes these basalt flows were huge. The biggest warming we've ever observed, the biggest mass extinction we've ever observed, the biggest ocean acidification we've ever observed, was at the end of the Paleozoic, about 252 million years ago. Um, and this was in, in uh, Siberia. And over the course of many thousands and even 20 and tens of thousands of years, lava was pouring out over the ground, eventually covering an area that's equivalent to all of the United, about 90% of all of the United States. I mean, just imagine basaltic lava all the way from New York City to San Francisco to Seattle to Miami. That's what happened. Would that be something like, if, like for example, like if the caldera went up in uh, Yellowstone? Wouldn't there be lava flows throughout no, the eastern seaboard? Yellowstone was an explosive volcano, and it deposited ash all over the, the eastern seaboard. What I'm talking about is basalt flows like you see in Hawaii, like we just saw in the eruption of Hawaii, but having that continue for tens of thousands of years. So just think of those basalts of flow. like we see in Hawaii covering the whole United States. I mean, that's a huge so there wouldn't amount be that much, of basalt. There wouldn't be much basalt flow from Yellowstone? Because I thought, from what no. I remember reading about the caldera in, in Yellowstone, that went up, it would actually have flow at least past the Rockies. That's not true. Well, what it was, it was it was an exploding volcano, and it exploded ash, and it emitted rhyolites, which are an ac acidic kind of uh, eruption. It's different from basalt. The big explosive volcanoes erupt different. They don't. There's not much basalt basalt associated with big explosive eruptions. Okay, so gotcha. they're, they're the different kind of beast. They're the ones that cause cooling. Initially, they might have caused some warming, but they cause cooling. Um, and all explosive volcanoes throughout Earth history, which includes all of the Yellowstone eruptions, the eruptions from uh, uh, the Cascade volcanoes, the eruptions from uh, 
major volcanic systems around the world. Those are typically explosive. They happen within hours. They're over within days, but they have a huge effect. The basalts we're talking about happen over years, over centuries, over tens of thousands of years. They just flow out and they ooze out over the land and they're emitting a lot of chlorine and bromine and hot gases that we observe cause ozone depletion and that causes the warming. Well, there, um, do you think we'll see so, any... So the green, real quick, sure. one second, one second. So the greenhouse gases from the volcanoes does cause global warming? It's only from the... No, it's the greenhouse only from the, the ozone depletion. The gases that cause global warming are chlorine and bromine. They are erupted by all volcanoes. Okay, okay. But it's the explosive volcanoes like the Yellowstone that form the aerosols that cause the cooling. Gotcha. Um, do you think that we'll see any um, negative effects from the volcanoes that went off recently in Hawaii? Like, would that kind of alter the uh, atmosphere in any way? Well, what's interesting is the eruption of Bardabunga in Iceland in 2014, in six months, erupted more basalt than had been erupted in Hawaii in 28 years. So the rate generally is much, much higher um, in Iceland than in Hawaii. Now, the recent eruption in three months erupted the same amount of basalt as erupted in three months in Iceland. But it didn't last as long. It was only half as long. So I'm convinced that the Hawaii eruption recently did cause some warming, but not anywhere near as significant as happened at Barthabunga in Iceland. And Barthabunga and the eruption, recent eruption in Hawaii were much more voluminous than previous eruptions in Hawaii, at least over the last few decades. So Hawaii eruptions generally don't have much effect on climate. The most recent one did have a slight effect. Got it. Okay. Steve, you... Um, since, since you mentioned oceans earlier, maybe we can touch on that a little bit because I'm, I'm curious myself. Can you kind of relate how the global warming has affected the oceans? Because the oceans are going to obviously store a lot of thermal energy, and obviously because of uh, Charles' law is going to get – they're going to expand, and that's going to cause a lot of uh, – land that we have to be no longer be land is going to be underwater things like manhattan and, and new york so the the if, if the trends continued upwards if the global warming continue upwards and the increase of the temperature of the ocean how, how can you kind of explain to people why that's so detrimental that, that why we don't want the oceans to get warmer well it turns out a large part of the climate change story is in the oceans and so it's good that we're getting to this now because, first of all, ozone depletion lets more ultraviolet B in. Ultraviolet B penetrates the oceans hundreds of meters. Bottom-dwelling fish have more sensitivity to ultraviolet than top-level fish because that's the radiation that they see, that they have to live with. And their eyeballs are not screwed up by that radiation. Where a baby that's born in the United States, born in the world, has more sensitivity to ultraviolet until they get exposed to it, and then our, our eyes are not that effective. Anyway, that's going aside. In in the oceans, it's the ultraviolet B penetrating the oceans that cause the warming of the oceans. The fact that ozone still remains depleted is causing the oceans to warm, and we see the ocean heat con is increasing. Now, the other thing that ultraviolet B does is cause sunburn. One thing you hear a lot about in the oceans is the coral reefs are being destroyed. The general argument at the moment is because the water is getting warmer, the coral reefs are being destroyed. But there's now pretty good evidence that what's destroying the coral reef is ultraviolet B. It's being sunburned. The organisms on the surface of the coral reef Cannot, are being sunburned, are being killed by this ultraviolet B radiation. So, um, again, as long as ozone is depleted, we're going to be destroying um, the coral reefs that are out there. 
Now, in terms of expansion of the ocean as it gets warmer, yes, you're absolutely correct. The hotter the ocean is, the more it expands. The other thing that changes with that is the solubility of CO2. Warm water does not absorb CO2. Cold water absorbs CO2. We all know this when we sit in the bar and talk too long. The beer emits CO2 as it gets warmer into the air. So this correlation between CO2 and ocean temperature or air temperature is very clearly related to the solubility of CO2 in water, in liquid. And we know what that is. We can measure that. And it turns out the best data show that the ocean warms before the atmosphere of CO2 increases. It's actually happening hand in hand. But the warming is being caused by ultraviolet radiation, not by CO2. The increase in CO2 is being caused by the warming. Now, the other thing you mentioned about oceans that's very important is they're kind of the capacitor in the system. They're the battery. They're what stores the heat. And what the reason that the cooling is so incremental is that you're only cooling the ocean for about three years, but it takes a long time for that to be absorbed into the ocean. And the effects of explosive volcanoes on the ocean will only continue as long as the volcanoes keep happening every few decades. As long as explosive volcanoes that are big enough to cause the aerosol layers keep happening every, every few decades. And that's why we get the slow incremental cooling. Uh, I think you mean store thermal energy because you can't store heat because, again, heat is in transfer. But I, I get what you're saying. Um, so, I, yeah, I, 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 I do think that you're right on, on most of this. I do think that, and again, I'm nowhere near your caliber. So I, this is a layperson, you know, guy off the internet perspective. Um, but I do think you're right about the coral. Um, coral that has been exposed to ultraviolet radiation, especially when there's a, a low zenith angle where you have the sun um, higher up in the sky from the zenith, and you have a direct, more direct uh, path from ultraviolet rays straight down rather than um, something like this, which is... Uh, more parallel to the ground rather than orthogonal, you're going to have a, those corals have, from what I remember, have a higher degree of bleaching, a higher degree of being killed off because of the angle of incidence of, of the rays coming in with respect to the zenith. And so that would be indicative of what we would expect if the cause of the deaths of the coral is going to be from UV radiation, would it not? Well, the greatest and coral shower bleaching water. observed. The greatest coral bleaching observed was in 2016. And 2016 was the greatest ozone depletion observed because of the Bartha-Bunga eruption. And it was the greatest temperature observed. 2016 was the hottest year on record. 2017 got a little cooler. We, so anyway, when the, the ozone, when the ozone depletion was greatest, you got more ultraviolet B, which means you got more bleaching. And all I'm saying is the year that we observed the greatest bleaching was exactly the same year we observed the greatest ozone depletion. I got you. I, I just remember reading that that uh, in, sh in shallow waters, the, the, the coral tends to be more bleached in certain areas with respect to the sun having a higher altitude than at, at lower altitudes, which would me anybody who gets a sunburn, you know, is that you're going to get more likely to get sunburned at the equator than you are at higher latitudes, unless you have snow, because then you have snow burn. But so I think, I think that there's a, definitely a correlation there. So you're, you're saying though, that the, the, the effects of the bleaching of the coral is, is actually more contributed to ultraviolet radiation than the actual temperature of the water itself going up. Correct? Yes. Yes. I mean, the water temperature may have an effect, but it takes a long time to warm the water. The heat capacity of the ocean, of the water, yes. is very high. So the water temperature goes up very slowly, whereas the sunburn effect is instantaneous. And so that's yeah, why... Yeah, no, that, you know, that would make sense, yes. And the water temperature is continuing to go up. The ocean is continuing to get warmer because ozone remains depleted. Yeah, no, that makes sense to me. Um, um, I'm going to be taking some questions here soon, so 
Yeah, um, I was going to say the same thing. I will take some questions, but just out of my curiosity, it has nothing to do with uh, the climate change question, but you studied um, volcanology. So what are the chances that um, Yellowstone could erupt in the, you know, the near distant future? Is that a possibility of something that um, I've seen a lot of like shows, especially on YouTube, where they talk about Yellowstone and how if it erupts, it would, you know, destroy uh, civilization as we know it. So is that something that we truly should be worried about? No. I live in Jackson, Wyoming, just down the street from Yellowstone. I wrote the hazard brochure for, for Teton County explaining the potential hazard from Yellowstone. There is no reason to believe that Yellowstone will erupt anytime soon. If there was to be a major eruption similar to the one 640,000 years ago, there would be m many smaller eruptions ahead of time. We've been pretty good at predicting volcanic eruptions because volcanic volcanoes begin to show they're active months before they explode. Typically, you can record earthquakes. You can record deformation of the ground. Yellowstone is one of the most densely instrumented uh, volcanic areas in the world. It's being studied by many organizations from the U.S. Geological Survey, University of Utah, uh, University of Wyoming. Many different groups are studying it very heavily. It's heavily monitored. I also receive Google alerts every day with anything to do with volcanoes. And the amount of trash that's coming out about Yellowstone is just unbelievable. Uh, you know, people, Wait, all you the say data from Yellowstone... People, there's a right. lot of nonsense that's being put out on the web about Yellowstone. All of the people that study Yellowstone in detail would agree with me, it is highly unlikely to have any major eruption without a fair amount of warning. And that highly unlikely to have any eruption at all. Hmm. There are other places would like you say Yellowstone. The next thousands of years? Hmm. There's no reason to believe that it's going to occur any time in you know, it may happen again in, in several hundred thousand years. There are other volcanoes like Yellowstone that are just as dangerous or more so. Um, Long Valley area, Mono Craters area in California was the site of a major eruption, it's almost as big as Yellowstone. Um, there's uh, around the world, there are a number of calderas that, that could cause major eruptions. At this point, we don't see any evidence for it. And again, volcanoes tend to give evidence before they erupt. Let me ask a follow-up to that. How, uh, if it did ex erupt, how catastrophic would it be to the planet? That's still debated. What we do know for sure when Yellowstone erupted before was that fine ash fell on the East Coast and that ash measured in inches fell in the Midwest. Most of it was downwind. It was to the east. So the, the ash falling uh, in California and Oregon and Washington was not that great. Mm. We know that the biggest eruption that we've ever conceived of was a Tobo volcano back in maybe 72, 75,000 years ago. That happened to be a time when there was a bottleneck in human evolution. A bottleneck meaning that the number of humans alive decreased to a very small number somewhere in the around 70,000 years ago. There have been many studies trying to relate that to the Toba eruption that was 74, 75,000 years ago. And the dating on all of those is good, is bad enough that you could make them together. It's not clear. There's clear evidence that people in southern India survived that eruption quite well. So there's no evidence that we know of the moment that a single volcanic eruption can wipe out the earth. Just like a single meteor impact. A single meteor impact can have a huge influence on climate for a while. But it's not clear that it can wipe out Earth or wipe out life on Earth. The big extinction of 66 million years ago was largely related to the basalt flows in India uh, that are known as the Deccan basalt, the Deccan traps, that were debilitating climate, heating climate for a long period of time. In the middle of that, suddenly we get the meteor, and it certainly heats on a lot of problems. And it may 
have been responsible for certain deaths, especially nearby in the southern U.S. in northern Mexico. But it's not clear what its effect was worldwide. This is the kind of thing scientists still argue about, and they're still trying to find data that can uh, tell us what's going on. Yeah. Awesome. All right, Steve? Yeah, I mean, well, there, I mean, there are, I mean, there clearly there are, can be, can be events that are so catastrophic with an impact, like the, the, the one that caused the moon, where you have a complete liquefaction of the, the crust. It could not be. I mean, that would be a, a, a complete wipe of all life. That can't happen, right? It's improbable, but it can't happen. Well, that was, that was back very early in Earth's history when the moon uh, separated. Yeah, heavy from Earth. Earth. I mean, Yeah. Yeah, we're in a very different situation now, and that was yeah, I, I agree. You know, that was I'm due to a very, out there. I mean, if an Earth-sized meteorite started came down and hit Earth, we could we're clearly going to get wiped out. Mm -hmm. But those even smaller meteorites. I mean, at this point, most most meteorites that we're talking about that could that are in our solar system that are likely to hit us are not big enough to knock knock Earth apart. They could cause a direct hit. Could cause problems, as as it clearly has. I mean, the the uh, the hit back in sixty six million years ago was a big hit, and it, and we can model the results that we think happened, and it had it had big effects. But again, the probability of something like that happening are very very small. Hmm. Okay, um, we're gonna we got a lot more now. Uh, first... to worry about. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't think Yellowstones are going to be an issue either. Um, the first question is actually a super chat and in the live chat. So I'm going to ask the, the super chat one because it's the same question. But because zero uh, one three three two one three two for six 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 asked, why is Venus so much hotter than it should be based upon incoming radiation alone? Why doesn't outgoing infrared flux matter? And that's a great question. Smitty asked the same in the live chat. Why isn't the why is there a greenhouse effect on on Venus causing it to be so much harder than it should be because of the the carbon that's in the atmosphere and sulfur that's in the atmosphere for Venus. Well, carbon first of all, the right. amount of the amount of carbon dioxide is much much higher than what we're talking about on Earth. I mean, on Earth we're talking 0 0.04 percent of air having carbon dioxide. So for every carbon dioxide molecule that absorbs energy. There's 2,500 other molecules that don't absorb energy. Secondly, it's not, we, we think, we, we explain the temperature on Venus uh, based on what we think is the composition of what's going on, on uh, with the CO2. But it may be that simply more ultraviolet C and ultraviolet B radiation is what's warming Venus. So this is where we have to be very careful in science. We develop a pet theory. It seems to work. We explain everything in the world based on that theory. I'm now showing that that theory does not work and it cannot work. So I'm not convinced that the reason Venus is hotter is the reason we are currently explaining it that way. This is what keeps scientists employed. I mean, this is exciting, actually. We've got a whole new way of looking at things now. And we need to go back and look at them very carefully. Okay. Uh, time ask. Uh, ask if CO2 can reflect and retain heat irrespective of its absorption. Uh, by the way, yeah, you can't retain heat. Again, retain, heat can never be retained. Thermal energy can. Heat has to be constantly in flow. It has to be in motion. But I think that kind of question actually is a great question in a way that if, if the ultraviolet radiation is causing the temperature increase, what is causing the retention of the thermal energy in the atmosphere? Because something has to actually cause that that thermal energy to be retained in the atmosphere rather than being dissipated to space. And that's what I think where the global the, the greenhouse gases would come in, wouldn't it? Because you have, like you said, a, a more of a thermal insulation, more of a blanketing effect. The only place that, that we observe the only place that we observe air getting hotter in the atmosphere is in the stratosphere. Okay? Air cools from the surface of the Earth to the tropos the bottom, to the top of the troposphere. Then it starts warming in the stratosphere. We know what is causing that warming is dissociation of oxygen, ozone, CO2, and all the other gases. It's dissociation that causes the warming. Simply absorbing energy, infrared energy, that doesn't cause dissociation, 
does not cause warming of air. That's where the mistake is. Now, you've several times said that heat is only flux. And that is exactly what you're taught in thermodynamics. What I'm right. showing now is what <laughs> heat physically is. What I'm showing is disagrees with what you learned with in, in thermodynamics. I'm showing what heat actually is. Heat is the oscillation of all the bonds that hold matter together at all those frequencies. And so I can now talk how's about that, heat that in thermic energy. Well, it, it, it turns it, out it, it energy is just the resonance of the atomic bombs. Go ahead. We, like I said, we have a little bit of lag, so I do apologize. Go ahead. So if the, if the, if the heat is just the resonance of the oscillations of the bonds, right? And like I said, I totally agree with you on all that. But if that's what the heat is, isn't it? How is that differentiated from just the kinetic energy of the system? Well, what's interesting is the energy of radiation, most physicists would agree, is equal to the Planck constant times frequency. And in fact, the definition of a photon in particle physics, if you look it up in Wikipedia, is that the energy is what's called the Planck Einstein relation energy equals the Planck constant times frequency. Now, the interesting mm -hmm. thing about that is that frequency, as we've been discussing, is a spectrum. It's not a number. It's a spectrum. And what that says is that a spectrum times a constant must be a spectrum. So that energy of radiation is not a photon. It is a spectrum. This totally upsets particle physics, which is one of the results of what I'm talking about here. But what it says is that energy is frequency. What thermal energy is, is nothing more than frequency. And it's the frequencies of oscillation of all those different frequencies that are happening within a body that are what we call heat. And that re when that's radiated, we radiate that heat and it's absorbed into another body. All we're radiating are frequencies. All heat is, is frequencies. Now, it's a little weird to think of a physical thing as being just frequency. Well, you know, the interesting thing about light is we don't see light until it interacts with matter. We don't see light traveling across the air unless there's a few specks of dirt or dust or whatever in the air. So radiation, light, is not something physical. It's just frequency. And when it interacts with matter, then we see those frequencies. That's what visible light is. It's those it's different frequencies. This is what yeah, we won't so see the photons different so about scattered off something, right? Well no until it causes resonance. I mean when you look at something that's lit by the sun, you're seeing the color of that object. That object is resonating at that color. And that causes resonance in your uh -huh. eyeballs. Or it's just the frequency that's being absorbed by the particle being re-emitted. We think of it as being re-emitted. It's just, it's resonating with the eyeball. Now, this takes a little getting used to because we're talking about something yeah, well, you can't see. Especially for me, because I'm, I'm a color or realist. I don't think colors exist. I think colors are just a phenomenon in the brain. So I, I totally discount colors as even a real thing. Fake so, yeah, I'm trying to wrap my head around this. Because I, I I learned it as you know energy right energy is is proportional or equal to um, the frequency times Planck's constant right so you're saying though it's not just it's not the energy that's that's equal to Planck's constant in the frequency it's it's heat because I think I think what's happening well, is you're just you're just saying that it's just one type of energy you're just saying thermal energy is going to be either equal or proportional to frequency times Planck's constant right. Uh, I'm talking conventionally. This is the how I learned it, is energy is, no. is, is equal to Planck's constant. Yeah, I mean, that's what everybody believes. I mean, that's, uh, uh, that, and if you look up the energy of, ra of electromagnetic radiation, that's the equation that's used to calculate that energy. Sure. I want to go back to what you, mm -hmm. uh, what you were just saying in terms of the, um, I've lost it where you uh, <laughs> The color yeah, the, is the color, color really. is something. Color is something. 
the color is something, but perception has an effect on it too, and I'll explain. We know that the color red is about 500 trillion cycles per second. And we know that every shade in the visible spectrum, we can assign a number, a frequency number to it. What's interesting is that when that's translated into our brain, those frequencies don't include, for example, the color brown, okay? The visible spectrum goes from red to blue, um, red, yellow, green, blue, violet. Um, it doesn't include the color brown. Our perception of brown in our brain is a result of the three different sensors in our eyes of sensing color and how that's mixed together in our brain. So going back to your statement that you don't believe color is a real thing, it is a real thing, but it is not exactly the way our brain sees it. And so you're, you're partially right. Um, but yeah, well, color, I would say that, the, uh, that I, I, I would say there's a difference between a phenomenon and the noumenon, right? And I would say that phenomenology, from a phenomenon point of view, colors do not exist. Now, if you want to associate that with a specific frequency, that's fine with the, the exception of pink. Pink has no corresponding wavelength to, to actually even say that. So that's one exception. And the other thing is, if we dream in color, there's no photonic energy being, being introduced into that system at all. We, we do dream in color, at least I do. And that has nothing to do with photons. So it is purely a phenomenological, phenomenological event that's happening strictly in the brain. That's why when I say that colors don't exist, I am talking about as the phenomenon itself. We, we can measure the wavelength and assign that to be a specific color, but what we perceive in our, in our brains, that is just literally in our brains and no more real than a dream. It's okay, Steve. You that, can be that's wrong. That's how I explain color realism. You can be wrong. It's okay. But I'm not. <laughs> it's totally okay. Yeah. No, I, I, mean, I you, think you're, you're partially agreed. right. Okay, well, I'll take a part. You can dream color, but the, the parts of your brain that process color can be involved in your dream. They don't have to be processing real color. They can, uh, and in your dream, you know from living in experience that red lights are red. And so if you dream a red light, that's, that's knowledge that's in your brain. You don't have to have a red light out there stimulating your brain to have you dream about it. So again, the, the, the physical color, we know that if, if, if something oscillates at a frequency, at a particular frequency, it will be, if it's in the visible range, a particular color. But what our brain does with that, the way that colors are perceived and processed in our brain is much more complicated and much more involved. And there's no reason why you're dreaming that a lot of that cannot be going on in your brain, even though it's not responding to what's coming from the eye. Beautiful. Okay. I mean... I'll, I'll take I'll take a, a partial. Um, I, I disagree, by the way, but I do think that the phenomenon is just like a dream. Dreams are not real in my paradigm. Um, dreams are a phenomenon. They have no real consistency in the actual world. There's no noumenon for it. But that's dreams that's how I dreams are not real. Are you out paradigm. of your mind, Steve? Well, yours might well, be. Steve, I, I think we're going to have to have one. I think we're going to have to have another show on what is reality. Yes, that's you know, a, that's no, we a lot all of love. I would love that. Are you, you kidding? Know, I, yeah. I, I mean, can I, without going too much in the side thing, I mean, I, do you accept things like naive realism or you're an idealist or a realist or? Because I love that topic, actually. What is real? I'm a very practical person. I, what's different from me as a geophysicist compared to most physicists is I want to see it, touch it, feel it. I only believe what I can see, touch, feel, directly understand in nature. And part of the problem I got into with climate change was things weren't making sense. It didn't make sense, for example, I couldn't figure out what happens when a photon hits a CO2 molecule. There is nobody in the world that can explain that. And that's when I began to realize, wait a minute, light can't be photons. Anyway, the way I think is I want it to be physically intuitive. If it physically exists, we must be able to understand it physically. The problem that happened in okay, physics see. back in uh, 1910 was they forsook reality. They forsook 
physical intuition and said, well, at the molecular level, at the atomic level, things just must be different. The first thing you learn when you take a course in quantum mechanics, it does not make physical sense. It does not physically intuitive. Get over it. Sure. Forget about it. Okay, so, so let, me, that's the let me clarify this. because There's two things I got to clarify here. Um, okay, first, um, you, you would be an empiricist. You, 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 you generally go to empiricism or even an evidentialist, but you said something that was really kind of surprising to me. You said that photons are not light. You don't think that, that, that light is comprised of quantum packets that we would call it photons? We have argued for 2,500 years whether light is waves or particles. Mm, I, the not interesting really. thing I, about I mean, that is... About the, both how you, well, depending on how you observe it. Yeah, it goes back to the Greeks, and okay. whether it's waves, particles, or wave-particle duality would be the modern way of looking at it. Yeah, wave. I can now show it's physically impossible for waves to travel through space. Light cannot <laughs> be waves. This was studied intensely in the late 1800s, looking for the luminiferous ether. There is no way that light can right. travel through space as waves. I can show well, that light okay. cannot travel particles through space. It cannot travel as photons. What I'm saying is light travels as resonance. That's where the resonance Okay, wait, wait, wait. I got, I got, to, I got to ask this. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I, I don't want to go down to this rabbit hole. But, okay, you're saying, okay, so, for, so you actually accept a luciferous ether? I mean, because the way it, it, it's posited now, electromagnetization produces its own medium as it propagates. That's why Michelson Morley experiment was... A failure basically because it didn't t t detect any kind of luciferous ether and so therefore the special theory of relativity was more parsimonious you're saying now that light doesn't doesn't now need a medium and it needs some kind needs some kind of ether to propagate through no no okay we no. show so, that there is no luciferous ether there is no way for light to travel as waves through a luminous ether now, right, but it can't do it through we its own medium. I mean, it produces its own medium, right? That's the rationalization. I was waving my arms earlier because that's the rationalization that everybody uses. You know, the interesting thing about humans, what's great about humans is not their intellect. It's their ability to rationalize. And we've rationalized electromagnetic radiation as propagating in its own medium. Now, right. I just look at that differently. What we know is that frequency of oscillation of an electric charge causes what we think of as an electric field. Oscillation of an electric field causes what we think of as a magnetic field. Oscillation of a magnetic field causes what we think of as an electric field, ad infinitum. Resonance, mm -hmm. I believe, happens by that interaction of what we think of as an electromagnetic field, electric field, magnetic field. That's what allows resonance to happen. But it's not happening. Uh, I, Light is not traveling as particles, and it's not traveling as waves. See, see it's funny. Is I, I don't agree with you on that, but I do agree on other instances. Like, if you were to apply that to electron, I would agree with you. Electron can, be, can, can actually be thought of as a vibration in a field. That's one of the modern ways of looking at an electron, is that it's just a, a perturbation in, um, in, in a field. And that's how, and you. That's why you can detect it as a as a, as a actual particle when you try to observe where it's located in the probabilistic space, right? In, in the in the psi wave function. So, if I want to look at, it, at an atom and I say, okay, here's the orbital that it, the electron could possibly exist in. It has this range it can be in. It's just a mathematical probability. It's a it's a point possibility in space. It doesn't actually exist. So in that way. The, the, when you actually observe the electron, it's just a point in the field that is having a, a frequency of some kind. That actually I can hold to. But the light itself, I've never heard it applied to photon in that way. Because, of well, again, the, the way I learned, I, I'm right. a conventional person. <laughs> no, and what you're talking you agree, about is conventional. conventional right? Okay, because I, I don't want to put up misinformation. From, from, from a conventional standpoint, I haven't been too far off, have I? 
No, you've been right on target from a conventional standpoint. You okay. were saying what most <laughs> physicists would say. Good. Okay. One of my closest friends is one of the top theoretical physicists in particle physics. And we've discussed this for years. And finally, a couple oh, of years ago, and he's, refused, and he's refused to step back from the mathematics. He's a theoretical physicist, and he thinks in terms of math. He's refused to step back from the mathematics and meet me at the level I'm talking about, that photons are a mathematical, or a figment of mathematics. They're not a reality. Anyway, what he said to me a couple of years ago, he says, Peter, if you're right, everything I've done in my life is wrong. Now, that's He's hard point, for right? any human being to deal with. <laughs> uh, However, if you go to my website, that, why right? climate change, if, if you go to my website, whyclimatechanges.com, if you go to my book, What Really Causes Climate Change, I explain why light cannot be waves. It cannot be photons. Those are both physical things, or at least we can think of them as physical things. It's clear that light is not a physical thing. It is simply frequency. And the only way that light can propagate, I argue, is by resonance. It cannot propagate by photons, and it cannot propagate by waves. Now, if I could convince you of that in a few minutes on the air, I'd be amazed. I mean, I'm trying very hard to convince the whole world of that, and it's not going to come easy because this is a fundamental difference, and it also brings into question a lot of particle physics. You'll find in my book in Chapter 11, I talk about dark energy and uh, what the cosmic microwave background is and those kind of things when you begin to understand that light is just frequency. And it's pretty interesting. And I'm there's a lot of debate this. to be done really to move forward. Yeah, well, I think you'll enjoy it. Come. Chapter 4 of my book was into the physics in great detail, and Chapter 11 talks about the future of physics and where we could go. So I, I'm convinced that light cannot be photons and it cannot be waves. Um, I have a question. Since I can tell that you like going against the grain with um, what mainstream science says, I think that you'll appreciate this question because I have something, too, that I go against the grain with on science. Now, let me get your opinion. What is your opinion as to the age of the Sphinx? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I assume the Sphinx was built at a given time during the Egyptian um, culture, <sighs> and I, I really don't have any information on it. Okay, fair enough. I was I was hoping maybe I would I would finally get somebody that. So it is me, but still, still one is the loneliest number. See, I, I, I think a more important question is because, because I, I, I guess I'm found out I'm a solipsist and I didn't know it, which I'm not. But um, do I exist? That's the question I really want to know, because that's the question out there. Does Steve exist? Because I have a lot of people that don't believe that I exist, and it's kind of a fascinating phenomenon. To be They're dumb. It's fascinating though. Well, it really, <laughs> I literally love that that that, that, that conspiracy theory that. Not even that. They actually believe don't believe that I exist for some reason. They don't actually really believe strange. that, Steve. You can't convince yourself. No, that they actually, but that's what they say. Right? They're lying to you. They're, well, they're no, dumb. Well, they, well, wait, wait, hey, well, 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 hang on. I mean, they they they, oh, no. they they claim they don't have a belief that I exist, and I can't oh. call them a liar for that because that's their beliefs. But it's still odd to say I don't believe that you exist because I have no beliefs. It's just bizarre. But they need they need um, a hobby. You want to get the last hobby. couple questions? Or? Yes, they do need a hobby. Yeah, they need a hobby. Right, go I, I, I've you know, got a couple, couple questions. What would you say, Dr. Ward? Go ahead. This gets, this gets back to uh, philosophy. When I took philosophy in college, I got a D. I just couldn't relate to philosophy. And a good example a hard, is the question, question. When, a tree, when the tree falls in the woods, if there's no one there to hear it, does it make noise? Now, I as a physicist know that when the tree falls in the woods, it sets up vibrations in the air that we call noise. And so if you want to define noise as something that only a human hears or only an animal hears, that to me is mental masturbation. That's not practical. Okay, what we know physically yes. exists is vibrations no, I in agree. the air. 
No, I, 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 I think that's already been resolved. To me, to me, it makes a sound. Yes. Whether you exist or not, it gets down to a choice of words. And that's where I tune out. I mean, to me, I want to know what's physically happening. You exist in the sense that you're eating food and you're expending energy and that um, you're one of the animals on this earth. And, and whether somebody else wishes to think that you exist or not, um, there's a question of their, their position on what existence is. <laughs> and, Kudos. Uh, but physically, biologically, you're living right now. Perfect. Mental yeah, masturbation no, I definitely agree the with correct you. word yeah. there. Yeah, I definitely agree that, that that if a tree falls in a forest, but there's a sound, because to me, the definition of sound is the compression or refraction of, of, of air, right? So you have a wave in the air. That's sound. You don't have to be there to actually hear it. But my existence, they, it's not that they don't believe that I exist for, because of the fact that they're questioning my the, the existential nature of me. They, they're questioning the epistemological approach that they don't have any beliefs. And so they are more of an epistemological nihilist, such as they don't hold knowledge, they don't hold beliefs, and those, they won't say, I believe that you exist. So it goes to that epistemology more than it does uh, who, existentialism. Who cares? But, uh, existential. So. Well, it's fascinating to me. I, I like well, philosophy. So, I mean, when people say that kind of stuff, it's, it's really amazing to me. Oh, oh, God. Yeah, well, that goes to philosophy. I mean, there is a definition of yes. terms. But what terms you accept yes. as exist? and uh, how you want to define them. And it is a lot of fun for a lot of people to argue. For me, I tune in. I enjoy it. If it doesn't make physical sense, <laughs> I'm not interested. Same here. Yeah, if it's, well, uh, let's get to the Super Chats real quick, and maybe they got some uh, physics stuff in there I for thought we you, did okay? Super Chats. No, we got some more. Oh, okay. Got more coming in. Um, let's see here. Wellington Smith asked um, for $5. Ask the guest. Guest. If the sun's radiation heating the Earth's atmosphere, yes or no, I don't know. So ask the guest, is the sun's radiation heating the Earth's atmosphere? Yes. And he says yes, no, or I don't know. It's heating the stratosphere. Yeah. Okay. It's heating the stratosphere. Okay. What's heating uh, the atmosphere just above the Earth is the, the sun is heating the land. It's being absorbed by the land, and that land is radiating heat. So the the surface temperature, the surface air that we're standing in is being heated from the sun being absorbed by the earth. Up in the stratosphere, it's being heated by absorbing ultraviolet C radiation. But okay. the uh, earth is heated by the sun. Yes, I, I think everybody would agree on that. Uh, Sarah B, at $5, is cesium fluoride Heavier than nitrogen and oxygen, how does it make its way up to disrupt the ozone layer since 1970s? Is ozone better or worse? So I think he's asking if cesium or chloride. Or it basically, how, go ahead. Any, any chlorofluorocarbon, um, the weight, you know, it, it consists of a lot of molecules. So the atomic weight is greater than many of the gas molecules. What we know is that it takes about five years for the chlorofluorocarbons to work their way up into the stratosphere. And we have to assume it's with turbulence, it's with storms, it's with thunderstorms, it's with other things. But it, it, we measure that it's three to five years for the mo a given molecule to reach the stratosphere. It has to reach the stratosphere to give you broken down by ultraviolet to release the chlorine. So one of the problems with chlorofluorocarbons is they provide a, a suitcase, if you will, to carry the chlorine atoms up into the stratosphere. Because chlorine um, is water soluble. One of the problems with the uh, depletion of the ozone from volcanoes is we still don't understand precisely the chemical reactions to get the chlorine up there to cause the depletion. We think it has a lot to do with the heat being released from the volcano. Uh, but anyway, there's a lot of details to be looked at. But the, the question okay. is a good one because it does not, doesn't appear to be logical to begin with. But we know things get moved up there. I have a, I have a, little, yeah, CFC, um, a little tidbit to add to that. Uh, it's, it's sort of related, but it, I just remembered um, something cool about the guy that found that, you know, he found the – 
CFC, or he's the guy that discovered CFCs or created them. Um, he also was the guy that put lead in gas and created later on in life a almost like a um, not like a hospital bed, but a, a way like a pulley system for him to be able to pull up because he uh, he couldn't walk. And um, it was actually like four years after he invented that thing that he got tangled up in it and it wound up killing him. So he had I, a. I think I remember reading something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and the, you're the right on. It's a fascinating story. I've forgotten his name right offhand, but uh, um, if you look up CFCs, and uh, uh, you can you can get to it. And he invented a couple of other things that have had disastrous effects yep. on climate. I Lead. mean, he he looks like the yeah, the ultimate black scientist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, who yeah, thought? But, I don't uh, know why you thought that was other, I think it was PCBs that he also had a big effect on. I mean, he's, oh god, I remember he, back that. Oh yeah, PCBs nightmare. There was a there was some kind of shocking statistic where, you know, because he he was the the, the guy that had the idea to put lead in gas because it um, was it quietened the knocking in your system. But up until like mm -hmm. uh, nineteen seventy nine or uh, nineteen eighty, uh, like eighty percent of kids that were were born or it was I think they were up to like grade school or something like that. But they had a uh, consumption of lead that was three times what should be allowed. Wow. It was uh, Thomas Midg Midgley. Yes. M I D G L E Y. Thomas Midgley, born in 1889, yep. died in 1944. But his two famous inventions are now called well, one was uh, uh, the lead in petrol gasoline, and two was the use of chlorofluorocarbons. Uh, not a very, not a very um, lucky life that guy led. Anyway, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, uh, Serbia, two dollars again. Uh, how many counts of hairspray equal one volcano? <laughs> um, that'd be interesting. That would be I, very interesting. I have to admit, I probably, to I probably contributed to this ozone um, issue myself uh, quite a bit. If the if the hairspray thing is where we're going with it, I've, I've put a many. Well, the hairspray in. nowadays. Nowadays, they use other gases for hairspray, but back in the 70s, they used chlorofluorocarbons. Um, what's important yeah. is that volcanic chlorine and bromine decreases the ozone for less than a decade, whereas CFCs cause a uh, decrease of ozone for decades, for many decades. That's the real difference. It's not so much the volume. I mean, there's huge amounts of chlorine and bromine put out by a volcano all the time, even just steaming volcanoes, ones that aren't even erupting. But uh, still, volcanoes are more or less our friend because they, they cause the, the cooling short term and they don't cause long term warming. Uh, so uh, anyway, that, that's a good, interesting question. Yeah, they do. They use other aerosol, other propellants now. I know, in like in air dusters, they use a tetrafluorothane um, for that. But uh, that, if I remember correctly, tetrafluorothane doesn't really have a significant effect on on ozone. Um, Sabera, another five dollars. If energy is frequency, which is true, aether or the Higgs particle, Higgs boson guard particle, is it engineering versus physics, or is it synchronization? Go Rams. Oh, the Mandela effect again. I'm going to go with the Mandela effect on that one. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I'm gonna try to parse this out for you. I think he's saying is it it, it is he saying that energy that energy is frequency and that requires an ether or I don't know how he's relating to the Higgs boson because that has to do with imparting a mass. But well, I when I point out that that energy equals the Planck constant times frequency, mm -hmm. and that frequency therefore has to be is a spectrum. That's like throwing a hand grenade into the middle of particle physics. I would argue that particle physics headed down the wrong alley a long time ago when it forsake physical intuition. When it was decided during the 1910s and 20s that it didn't matter, that it didn't need to be physically intuitive, particle physics became mathematics. And the reason there are so many geniuses in particle physics 
is it took very complicated mathematics to fit a square peg into a round hole. I would predict if people accept the concept that I've pointed out, that energy is, everybody does accept right now that energy is a constant times frequency. But if they understand that what I'm saying is frequency is a spectrum, not a number, and not a photon, I can't predict at this point where particle physics will go. I'm really throwing a hand grenade out of the middle of the floor. Yeah, the only reason I'm trying to wrap my head around that is if you have a specific frequency in hertz and you're timesing that by Planck's constant, it's going to give you some kind of energy in joules of some kind. It's going to give you numerical values for, for an individual frequency level. So if I say that this, this photon has this specific frequency, if I want to know the energy level of that specific photon, I can just times it by Planck's constant and I get the energy. Does that formula no longer work for photons in your model? Well, forget about the photon. What does work very clearly, I mean, it was, it was Einstein in 1905 that emphasized Planck's equation, the, the energy equals a, a h nu, based on the photoelectric effect. And what we know about sure. the photoelectric effect is that when the frequency of light is high enough, typically blue to ultraviolet or to violet, that causes electrons in a fresh surface of metal to flow. We also mm -hmm. know that when the frequency is high enough, that dissociates oxygen. Okay? So what E equals H nu, this energy equals constant times frequency, means is but when the level of energy reaches some level, it causes the bond to break apart, the electron to come free or the oxygen bond to break apart. So E equals H nu is a perfectly good equation for calculating the level of energy. When you're talking about total energy, when you're talking about heat, now you have to look at the energy at absolutely every frequency. And what's important is the distribution of energy with frequency, not the amount of energy. We currently think in terms of amount. That's not as important. It's the distribution of frequencies that we see in what's called Planck's law. So, you know, I, as I said a while, well, many years ago, I said, what happens when a photon hits a CO2 molecule? How does it interact? What we know happens, a CO2 molecule absorbs infrared energy at a bunch of frequencies that happen to be the resonant frequencies of the molecule. That means the way the radiation is interacting with the molecule is through resonance. Now, if you want to think of it as being a photon, which is a particle, what happens when that particle hits the CO2 molecule? How's the energy transferred? What happens if it glances off the CO2 molecule? It just doesn't make sense. I mean, it was many years ago that I realized nobody, they can explain mathematically, but they can't explain physically what's happening. That means it's not physically existing. So I argue that photons are not something physical. They are something mathematical. They are very useful as a mathematical tool. And I think as we dissemble particle physics, Particle physicists have tried for 100 years to explain light and radiation. If we begin to understand that light and radiation are a little different from what we thought, there are a lot of things that particle physicists learn that I think are going to become very useful. But I'm convinced that realizing that light is travels by resonance opens a whole new route to a theory of everything, a simple theory that explains all of physics. I think that the standard model currently used in physics is stretched way too far away from reality, and that that is not close to it. When you realize the role of resonance, all of a sudden, a whole lot of things in physics begin to make physical sense. They fit physically. They're intuitively, just physically intuitive. And to me, that's the most important thing in physics, to be physically intuitive.
Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to, again, we're going to have to like par to get through these super chats, but I'm just trying to parse my head around that because the terminology you use is not familiar with me in concordance with I learned conventionally, right? Because you were talking about resonance. There is something called like resonance emission where you have a photon being absorbed um, by, by electron. You also have photonic emissions and you also have transitional states where you have an electron jumping in orbital that's going to go from one state of transition to a lower state. And by doing that, it has to release energy in the form of a photon, right? So that energy released because of the difference in transitional state, you're just saying is a, is a resonance of some type? What you're saying is absolutely correct in what's in physics books today. And most physicists today would say exactly what you're saying. I think it's wrong. Oh, that's good. I don't think okay. That, okay, it's I don't think that's fine. Energy levels, I don't think that okay. the energy Ooh. levels you're talking about exist. Okay. I would say that okay. the energy I just wanted to levels clarify. are over No, you, you, okay. you're representing modern physics very correctly. I appreciate that actually. It's been <laughs> I'm going back 20 years on this myself. So when you say that you got your, your, your thing about 30 years ago, I graduated from nuke school in 1989. So that tells you how far back it goes back myself. So um, it's been a long time, but anyways, okay, so let's get through the super chats real quick. Cause we're running out of time. Um, Klaus says for five Australian, if the ozone is so thin, why doesn't the sun burst up heat earth more? I, I, I'm trying to parse this out because Klaus is, is uh, English is a little broken. I think he's asking, um, if the ozone layer is so thin, why doesn't the sun sun heat up the earth more than it, it does? Why isn't it well, the amount the, sun, the amount the sun heats the earth is uh, proportional to the amount of ozone in the atmosphere. If you go back to this time I was talking about 252 million years ago, when there was this huge warming of the earth, the oceans became hot sub temperatures, 104 degrees Fahrenheit, the oceans, okay? This went on for a long time. What we do know is that ozone was depleted significantly at that time. We see mutations in plants. We see mutations in a number of different ways that would only be caused by the ozone layer being really, really thin. So yes, when the ozone layer is really, really thin, the earth gets really, really hot. And if this continues for a long time, like it did 252 million years ago, the oceans get really, really hot. Again, what I said okay. before is the temperature on Earth is basically proportional to, or inversely proportional to the thickness of the ozone layer. Gotcha. Okay, two, two more to get through and then uh, two real, really quick questions. Uh, that's only take about a minute. Uh, Sarah P at $2 says, this guy's wrong. Light travels in something, rams. Um, I don't know if light really actually travels in something. Like I said, I believe as conventionally that electromagnetic radiation produces its own medium as it travels. Thus, it doesn't need a separate, or as he mentioned before, some kind of luciferous ether to be propagated through. Um, that was the paradigm question a long time ago. Is there um, uh, ether that's required? Just like sound would propagate through water or through air or any kind of fluid, the, the conventional thinking back then was light would have to have some kind of medium as well. In, mo in modern physics, that's not necessarily the case. They, they realize that it's not, they don't have to have a medium. Um, would you agree on a conventional ship? That's how it would be, right? What I'm trying to do is spark debate. It's very clear from some problems with greenhouse gas theory and so on that there are some problems that go back into physics. And uh, that there's some misunderstandings in physics. I point these out. I describe them at length on my website. The website's the equivalent of a very thick book. It's fully referenced, and it goes into a great deal of information. There are lectures on it, talks that I've given, all the publications I've written. Um, it's all there. In my book, I go into it in great detail, what really causes global warming. I go into the physics in a couple of chapters in great detail. I would encourage people to read it and disagree. That's fine. We need to debate it. Awesome. The biggest problem we've gotten into in climate change is this concept of consensus. Consensus has squashed debate. Science is all about debate. It is absolutely clear to me that greenhouse gas theory is physically impossible. We need to debate it. 
It is clear to me that photons cannot exist. I don't expect people to agree with me right away. We need to debate it. We need to look at the arguments. Okay. Um, and I, I have no problem with that, actually. I mean, I think, I think there no, should be no, no, nothing out there in science that's um, untouchable, right? I think that everything should be questioned if there's reasons to question it, though. Um, so I, I do agree. There's there's no there's no sanctity in in, the, in in theories or no sanctity in scientific paradigms. Any of them can be overturned given enough evidence to do so. But I, I subscribe to Popper's falsification criteria. But one last super chat we got to get through. Uh, Sarah B at ten dollars. If light is a frequency, how does it make fire when it is concentrated or make plants grow due to chloroplast? Is everything non-material despite my senses, or is this a philosophical discussion, Rams? You really like the Rams, don't you, Severe? So I think he's just asking, if light's a frequency, <laughs> if you take a magnifying glass and you, you, you cause, obviously, the light to be um, uh, go to one specific point, it's going to have a concentration of the light rays. Um, how does it make fire by that? And I don't know why that has to do with the, the frequency, per, per se. I mean... A higher energy level the amplitude, more energy going into that system but go ahead the amplitude of oscillation increases um with the intensity of light okay so you can think of light intensity as being a greater amplitude of oscillation the greater the amplitude of oscillation the better the chance that you're going to melt the particle that the things are going to come apart that the bond is going to break so when you use a magnifying glass, you're taking, uh, you're increasing the amplitude not only to what's coming in from the sun, but what's coming in from several directions from the sun. And that's why you can burn ants with that with no problem at all. Um, so it, it, it all fits there. What's kind of interesting, you now, what's interesting is the energy and the amplitude and the frequency that's coming from the sun is the same temperature at the sun as it is at earth the difference is that less molecules on earth are interacting or resonating with molecules on the sun because of distance and so the thermal effect is much less it's only warming one molecule among thousands and those other molecules have to get warmed by conduction and this is a too big an idea to go into at the end of the show, but I kind of got there. Uh, it's really interesting when you begin to look at it and begin to understand how resonance actually works. Now, there's a lot of different kinds of resonances. Yeah. There's nuclear magnetic resonance. There's all kinds of stuff. The resonance I'm talking about is very straightforward, and I describe that very carefully in things that I've written. And I assume you're talking about a different a, a different type of intensity because I, I remember intensity being um, a measure of energy over a specific area of volume or specific, so not volume a specific surface area. So it, it, it basically, if I'm looking at the amount of intensity of light hitting the Earth, that's going to be how much sunlight's over a, a square mile by watts over meter squared. But you're 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 talking about intensity as far as the the light itself, right? Like, okay. Well, anyways, we we got to wrap this I'm up. Sure. I know we're getting late and. Uh, yeah, I'm talking about how bright the light appears to you. And that's the gotcha. amplitude okay. of the oscillation. There um, is a lot of confusion well, over terminology that you're correctly pointing out. Um, I take this opportunity now, uh, Dr. Ward, and let people know where they can um, find out more about you if they want to follow you, read your work, um, all that kind of stuff as we close out. My website is called whyclimatechanges.com. There's a Twitter channel, uh, uh, pow, hash sign, the letter Y, climate changes. My book is called What Really Causes Climate Change. It's available on the website or on um, Amazon or any other location. I also have a website that's called physically-impossible.com which takes you to a part of the other website. I also have another website called JustProveCO2.com. It points out we've never done an experiment that demonstrates greenhouse warming theory that it really works. It never has been shown to work. So anyway, there are lots of places to go. 
Again, the place to start would be whyclimatechanges.com. Awesome. Well, we appreciate you taking the time awesome. to uh, come and chat with us. I It was fascinating, even though I, I could only keep up with half of it. Once the uh, there were more than three syllables in a word, my brain checks out. But um, I tried nonetheless as best I could. So I, I thought it was fascinating. So I'm sure everybody else did, too. I loved it. Um, I, before I really we did. before we close out tonight, I wanted to uh, kind of announce something really cool that I've been trying to work on in the in the past month. Uh, we couldn't do it in I, the original idea came to me because of Halloween, and um, I didn't think that based on what this particular person does, this would be the worst time for him to come and uh, and do an interview and find out more about what he does, but. Um, nonetheless, Halloween's over and he has gotten back to me and we will be having him on the show. And I wanted to give you a kind of a preview of, um, who this was, because this to me is fascinating and disturbing and you're going to ask yourself so many questions, but, um, just, just take a look here and this will give you kind of an idea of who we've got coming. Wow, an extreme haunted house that's been in Rancho Penasquito's 14 years will soon be moving to Illinois unless someone steps in to help. It is wildly popular, but new tonight, 10 News reporter Kristen Kehoe shows us why some are eager to see it go. McKinney Manor Haunted House offers an experience so intense that no one has ever made it to the end. Patrons are willingly kidnapped, put in a straitjacket, and tormented for hours. Okay, so that uh, that just gives you guys kind of a... I don't want to play the whole thing because I don't want to get a, con uh, a copyright um, strike. But basically, the, the gist of this is this guy, for since 1980, has created this haunted attraction that nobody knows where it's at. It moves around the country. Uh, there is a waiting list of 24,000 people to get in, and they only take, I think, with their year-round when they take two a day, and it's eight hours. And uh, as to this date right now, there's only one person that has come anywhere close to that, and that was six hours. They only lasted, and no one's been able to complete it. So I asked him if he would come and sort of... There's a lot of things that go along with this. You know, it's deeper than just being a haunted house. Like, there are, um, like, is this ethical? Can Should this be allowed? Like, some of the things they do. Uh, I know that shocking people with car batteries is um, uh, one of them. So, I mean, they go extreme. I mean, this is, a, this is more than a haunted house. So, I just have so many questions. And I wanted to uh, let you guys know that this month he will be joining us and um, get your questions ready because uh and the cool thing about it is he's really funny like he, he's he's got a personality so it'll be a good uh, it'll be a good show yeah i only have three words to that no and hell no right yeah no <laughs> but, but the, everybody asks uh when i show this to people they're like uh this is a money-making scheme how much are they charging people to uh to do this to say they have the honor to do it and all it costs you is a bag of dog food they donate the dog food to uh the shelter and um then you're in so uh, but anyway, just a little preview. Uh, tomorrow, uh, actually, we will not be having at homies tomorrow because Jimmy will be on location, so um, there will be no show uh, tomorrow. We do have a Patriot, a private Patreon hangout, so we'll see you for that. Sunday, doubleheader. We have uh, Geo and um, the guy's name that I can't pronounce, uh, Shinobi three 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 three. They will be having a debate on flat Earth. That will be at four p.m. Eastern. And then uh, at 8, as always, Katie Paulson from Pathios will be joining us where we will be talking on The Smoking Nun about a uh, the voyeur pastor that was just caught up in um, a, a big scheme this past week and the lady that made her own blood sausage, but she didn't use what you're supposed to use for blood sausage. She used her own. So look forward to that. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a, it's a horrible story, but... Um, We'll get into that. All right, guys. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank to uh, Dr. Uh, Ward for coming by. This was fantastic. And we'll see you guys well. Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern. Thank you, Dr. Ward, very much. Very great conversation. Thank you. Oh, yes. 
I just leave this one word. Sure. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> Greenhouse warming theory is physically impossible dot com. There's a if way. There's to... only one thing you remember from your show. And I have bumper stickers, but they're too expensive to mail to you. Uh, hold on, hold that up. Let me see if this works. Oh, that's the wrong one. Oh, where are you at? This is a little test. Okay, here we go. Let's see if we can't zoom in on that. There we go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Make sure you go to uh, <laughs> physicallyimpossible.com. All right, there we go. Good night, guys. You have to have the hyphen. Good night. <laughs> Good night.